everyone and welcome to the first Grafana office hours of 2024. Yay! <laughs> I'm Nicole van der Hooven. I'm a developer advocate at Grafana Labs. And today we're going to be talking about application auto instrumentation with eBPF and Grafana Bela and pretty much what each of those words means because it's a, it's a mouthful. There's a lot it's to a loaded, talk about. Yeah, loaded topic. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> here to help me go through it all are my co host over here. Hey, Paul Baylog, another one of the Graf Grafana Labs developer advocates. Your favorite one, of course. <laughs> That's debatable. That part's debatable. We're not starting off the year, right? And you're already fishing for compliments. <laughs> you know, I'm always, yeah, yeah. It's everything to, you know, stroke my ego, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get that ego stroked. And down there is the one who's actually going to be providing value. <laughs> He's Nikola Gorchevsky. Welcome, Nikola. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikola Gorchevsky. I'm a software engineer at Grafana Labs. Working on all that mouthful, uh, EBPF auto instrumentation <laughs> at Grafana Labs. Uh, yeah. How long have you been at Grafana, actually? Actually, not that long. It's almost coming up to a year, so oh. um, so a little bit shorter than a year. Oh, you'll uh, be getting your mug soon. Your your yeah. one year oh, anniversary mug. I hope so. That mug. looks pretty cool. That looks pretty. Yeah, cool. yeah. They are a little bit know. different. I mean, they're all like custom made or something. I don't know. They're uh, or handmade. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, so, I, oh. I like one with the logo. Yeah, mine is plain white. Ikea. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like I, I should have I should have used that today, but I didn't. Mine's just mm. plain and transparent. <laughs> it, and it's just because you wanted your tea to match your hair. You were going for that. Yeah, sure. Color. That that is exactly yeah, it. That, that was entirely intentional branding. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola, what did you do before you joined Gravana? Oh, lots of things, I guess. Uh, uh, in many different areas. I actually started my career as a compiler engineer. I worked at IBM for 13 years um, on what's today known in op as OpenJ9. So it's a JVM implementation by IBM. Um, I worked on OpenJDK for a while um, mm -hmm. while I was at Microsoft. Um, and I, I did a stint at a company, a local, local Toronto startups, uh, I did SaaS software for a while, learned about observability monitoring and stuff like that. I also worked uh, for a bit over a year, I guess, almost two years at Elasticsearch on the um, Elasticsearch core infrastructure team. Yeah. And finally, this, this was uh, a big shift for me to uh, low-level observability with Grafana beginning of last year. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, mostly I'm a... I feel like compiler nerd. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, majority of my career has been in compilers. And, yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, one of the problems with observability is instrumentation. I think everyone, mm -hmm. you know, if you ask them if, if they want to be able to see into their applications, the answer is yes. The problem is that that's not always as easy as it sounds. Can you talk a little bit about instrumentation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a big topic. I mean, um, especially when I worked in the, for a company that SaaS, it, it was really difficult to pinpoint bugs in production. And you always, you know, the time you're looking at it, it's, it's past. The problem's not there anymore, or it happened something overnight, and it's a blip, and you're trying to understand how do we prevent that from happening again. And you always need more and more data to capture that. And, and of course, getting that data, there's many ways you can get that data. Sometimes this is an infrastructure level, uh, but sometimes you need more data of the application, right? So, so what just happened when we had this incident or when something wasn't working? Um, and adding that instrumentation to the applications is an effort. And developers don't like doing it. Uh, it's sort of necessary, but it's, it's, I don't know, like it's not essential at some time, like you're writing your code, you have your features, you have uh, stuff you need to do then um, to, to actually, for the, for the application you're working it on. Um, and then this is like sort of, oh, we also need to do this. There's never enough time for it. Um, so 
there's been improvement in the last little while about this. Um, there's obviously open telemetry, and now we have a lot of uh, auto instrumentation libraries. So you can think of it uh, instead of me manually adding instrumentation to my library or picking a vendor specific solution, I can just use one that's generic now. I can send signals uh, to multiple data sources. Uh, so I can maybe auto instrument my application rather than having to go through this drudgery of augmenting my code with various things. Um, but there's some challenges with that too. You know, it, it's not as easy as it sounds. Sometimes um, those auto instrumentation libraries work for some libraries. They don't work for everything that you have in your application. Sometimes you duplicate the signals. Like one, you know, you can have uh, one library use another, both are instrumented, and now you're getting double the signals. And there's no way to stop it because both support the auto instrumentation. Um, sometimes dependencies in your application are just outdated. You need to upgrade your dependencies to match where the uh, auto instrumentation library has as a dependency. Uh, it's not easy to do. Sometimes that migration path, depending on where your application stage is at, can take months or years to actually upgrade a dependency. Um, and you're doing it while the application is running in production. And you know how much effort should I spend on just getting this stuff out there? And of course, when you have a, an incident or something, like you're on call in the middle of the night, you need all the data possible. Um, so that... <laughs> So this sort of um, uh, problem is what actually drove the, the reason why we started working on this product through Grafana, this Grafana Bela, uh, is to, how do we mitigate this? Oh, my camera is getting weird. You guys, am I out of focus? It does yeah. get some You are a little bit, know. yeah. No, we thought you I just know. naturally got a little blurry. Yeah, I got blurry, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for the internet connection to go out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's my, my camera does this from time to time. I don't know what it is. I'll get close to the screen and maybe back out. Yeah, it'll correct itself. Don't worry about it. That's all right. Um, uh, so it, it sounds like there are two different levels of instrumentation, kind of two different approaches to it. The first is you can manually instrument your code. So you actually modify your application code. And, and in that way, you're telling it what, what signals or what information to collect. And this is the approach of, for example, like open telemetry, which which you mentioned, yeah. but also things like Grafana Faro does this. It it yeah. provides like a, a library, like an SDK for being able to instrument your front end to collect certain types of information. And then there's sure. another layer of like not not changing the application code, but instead somehow modifying the binary at runtime. Um, yeah. And it sounds right. like eBPF falls within the binary instrumentation method? Well, so yes and no, I guess to some extent, right? So auto instrumentation can be done by, in certain languages as possible, like Java. I worked on Java a lot, so I'm gonna use that as an example. Um, Java, the virtual machine in Java has this extensive way that you can extend it with additional agents. So it's really built as a platform where you can attach an agent and this agent has privileges that can sniff out data out of your JVM. Um, so for them, is for in, a J, in a JVM world, you attach this agent, you add it to your configuration, and all of a sudden you can see a bunch of stuff. Um, and it's an approach people use in open telemetry as well to gather signals from the application uh, for application observability um, with this approach. So it's not necessarily instrumenting the binary. There's no binary in Java, really. Uh, everything's done on the fly. Um, but there's this sort of approach. And I think .NET is similar to some mm -hmm. extent in this in this way. Um, but what we're doing with Bela is some, somewhat different. We, we either tap into the Linux kernel to extract some of the data. That application, at the end of the day, is setting some HTTP data, gRPC data. It's moving around through the kernel uh, interface to be able to be sent out to a, another service or to be received from an incoming request. So we monitor those signals and we stitch that story together about how, what the application is doing. Um, and in other cases, like in case of Go, we 
do actually um, attach to the binary with an mm. external program, sort of, and we take out the events. So we, we don't modify the binary itself, it's sort of um, like a debugger tool, if you will, where you can kind of, with a debugger, or like attach to a running process, stop it, look at it. And in this case, it all happens with this new technology or relatively new technology, EDPF. We were able to um, almost like I sit at a breakpoint um, mm -hmm. in an application, okay. collect data, and then move on, let the application go. It just happens really fast and uh, it's really low overhead, so we can actually capture many signals. And then again, we stitch those signals together with some additional tool that runs in the background. Um, so, would you say that that's a third level of instrumentation then, source, yeah. binary, and kernel? Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's it's that almost like external instrumentation. It's not. It's a, like there's application. There's approaches to instrumentation, which, like you said, binary, where after the application is built, instead of developers spending a lot of time modifying the source to add the instrumentation that there's tools that would instrument the binary rather than instrument the uh, uh, the, the source itself. Um, so there's tools like that. This is slightly different, sort of at a system level, or if you will, um, external to the application. It like only works on Linux. That's the, that's the sort of the negative aspect of it. If you're on a different platform for some reason, like you're using Windows, um, then yeah, it doesn't exist yet. But as far as I know, they're working on it. There's eBPF on Windows project that's on GitHub, and we don't know when. Maybe that lands into the Windows kernel, and we'll be able to do something similar on Windows. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to make mention of like uh, you know with the the three different uh, types or methods. You know, way back in the Java days when I was using Java, um, you know, and Spring Boot and things like that. Yeah, you you had some of these instrumented. Uh, libraries that you could just like kind of incorporate based on an annotation. So you yeah. would actually be updating the source in a way, but then you're not actually explicitly going and writing all this stuff. They have actual yeah. nice listeners and it's, it's lots of magic, but uh, it's, it's a hella yeah. convenient thing. I mean, <laughs> because yeah. as a developer, I'm lazy. I don't want to write yeah. all these, yeah. you know, I don't want to hit the keyboard all the time. So you know, I, whatever I can get out of the box from something else that's um, with magic, that's better for me. <laughs> yeah, we've hit on this a lot of times. This like, I mean, you call it laziness, but I, I call it effectiveness. Well, the true. dream for instrumentation <laughs> is auto magical instrumentation, yeah. right? It's like, I don't want to do anything. I want all this stuff just to magically come to me. And somehow eBPF is always mentioned in conjunction with that. Like, can you deconstruct this for us? Like, yeah. how does how does this magic actually work? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, I'll try. I'll try. Um, <laughs> Tell us so, the secrets of the universe. Yes, yes, exactly. So I, I guess... And this is how the story goes. But uh, so eBPF came from without the E in the beginning, it was like BPF. And it stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, today, people say the name doesn't mean anything. It's just a name. So just don't think of it. It's a name, eBPF. It's an acronym. Just learn it as a word. Um, and essentially, it was this support added to the Linux kernel that you could extend the Linux kernel's packet filtering capabilities we had additional logic. So you could just do better routing or different routing or for security reasons, you may want to take packets, change their, you know, internals, um, do something with them. Uh, and later on, people thought, well, this is kind of cool. Like we added this whole thing that we make the Linux kernel programmable to some extent. And why don't we just extend this and make it programmable for everything, right? Why don't we, why do we stop at, you know, socket filtering? We can do everything. And it sort of is a way, when you think about it, that the essence in the past, when you need to extend the Linux kernel's functionality, you have to write like modules. So binary programs, and you compile them for every kernel differently. And um, if they have bugs, they may destabilize your system. You add them and, all of a sudden you have a problem. Those are not maybe secure. You have a security hole and then 
all of a sudden your whole system is vulnerable, right? So people don't like them and they break often and you know each version is its own version of that module. So so but EVPF is almost like the same thing. You can actually extend the kernel functionality, but it's done completely differently. So what we have today, or where the technology has taken us, is that we have a virtual machine into the Linux kernel built into the Linux kernel. It's existed for a while. And this virtual machine, just like the Java virtual machine, can execute uh, instructions built for it. Um, just like in Java, you have a cross platform. You write the application once, you deploy it to any uh, Java capable system. You have the virtual machine on Windows, Mac OS, Linux. It works, right? You just load this and run it. So almost it's the same way. You can build this program for the Linux kernel or the virtual machine the Linux kernel have. And as long as you're within the bounds of capabilities of that virtual machine, you can execute your program almost portably across various Linux kernel distributions and extend the Linux kernel's functionality. And so how does this all work? The, so why is this better than the old Linux kernel modules approach? Because this virtual machine has built in verifier that verifies every instruction that's built by this program that first of all, it's safe. It's gonna to touch memory that's allowed to touch, that it doesn't do something weird. It doesn't break the kernel in any possible way. It won't cause problems. And it's sort of isolated. If it doesn't actually work, or there's any problem with it, there's, there's no side effect to the Linux kernel itself. So maybe the functionality doesn't work, but it's very safe in terms of um, usage within the kernel. So. People do lots of things with this. People, for example, monitor security with, uh, with this stuff. For example, you can monitor every time a new process is launched. You can so um, write a program, this eBPF program. This eBPF program, uh, you can tell it, well, get notified or run every time a new executable runs on my kernel. And then once you, once you actually get that event that you are running this uh, this new executable was launched, you get notified with a context around that executable start. And you can find out what the arguments were on the command line, what was actually running, what were the maybe privileges this executable ran with, and such things. So maybe you can generate security events out of this, right? You can say, oh, all of a sudden I'm running something I shouldn't be seeing on my system. So you can report on that, log it, and send it to uh, solutions like Grafana, Loki, and monitor these events and build something um, out of it, like a security solution. We don't use it for that, but we use it for something similar in our products. So we monitor socket events, for example. You can um, figure out every time uh, somebody makes an external socket connection, and you can check, oh, are they making an HTTP connection all of a sudden? Uh, extract that information, so build these programs that will do that and uh, during that SOC connection we can extract information or are we sending http packets okay well, what is the server we're sending to what are the what are the method what was the url and so on and that opens up the possibility for building observability solutions for uh web services if you will right the same thing like if you're talking to a sql server you can just figure out that the protocol is sql Okay, so I'm making a SQL request. Maybe I have a way to extract the SQL statement that ran um, and figure out what I was doing here. Um, so essentially, it's a way that you can write these programs and attach them to specific functionality into the kernel to run when something happens. And then you can have your program grab information about it. In certain cases, even write back. Uh, it's a very limited cases. And then once you actually collect the information you need, you're free to do whatever you'd like with it. There's ways to export it. And then you can either make a decision on the, at the time about this event or just simply log it or record it, which is what we do. Does that explain or maybe do you want me to go into any more detail, explain any other bits of it? I 
don't know if I well, let me let me try and <laughs> yeah. and summarize in a way to like see if I got it right. So it sounds like eBPF it, as the general technology, it can do a lot of things. It, it sounds like it's event driven. It's based on you know yeah. the things that can be can be observed at the kernel level, and it can actually be used for a variety of different use cases. So you you mentioned using it for security and observability, of course, but also things like load balancing and networking. Yeah. But Bela kind of zooms in on the observability part. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, it can be, I've seen people do all sorts of uh, interesting things with it. Like uh, one big thing, for example, in um, when you build web services and you deploy them, it's, there's always people talk about circuit breakers, or like you mentioned load balancing and stuff like that. So you can implement generic circuit breakers. Like essentially, like if your services um, need a circuit breaker in the sense that uh, if a downstream service is failing uh, or upstream people, uh, there's a discussion about what's upstream, what's downstream, but you're calling the service and the, and the service is actually failing, um, you don't want to be keep calling it, right? Because you, you are just putting more pressure downstream uh, because they're, um, they're already in trouble and you're just making the problem worse. So you should stop, maybe try again after 10 seconds, then progressively and eventually stop. That's a good behavior for a service consuming another service, but many people don't do it. Many people just, you know, you have an incoming request, you need something from somebody else, you call it. And if it fails, you retry it, and retry it again and so on. Or maybe you don't retry it, but, um, and, and that's so if how you, want you to get retry storms. Yes, yes. <laughs> and you get retry storms and all of a sudden every everyone fails, right? But it's not impossible to see that uh, at EVPF you could implement a generic circuit break where you're calling something downstream or upstream, where you will. Um, you detect that there's been some number of failures right there and you tell the caller, you simply reject that call. So the caller will get even though they don't have the circuit breaker functionality implemented in the application, you can implement it as a functionality extension into the kernel. So they have to respect it because they simply will get a rejection without even calling any remote service. Because with EPF, you can say, I'm issuing a TCP connect to this uh, service that I'm using. And you can just say, well, that call did not succeed. I'm sorry. You can return a operation code say no we won't let you and that's a circuit breaker implemented in EVPF that works for any service it doesn't matter what programming language is written in it will be done right so um there's a lot of experimentation and people have done like hot standby replace with EVPF they would have um you know one service and another one fails so they can just reroute it to a different one just with uh, kernel modules nothing needs to be built into the application itself, right? So yeah. this complexity can be done once for every programming language outside of that. That's kind of interesting, because I mean, that's kind of like, I never really thought about it with the circuit breaking pattern, because I mean, usually like uh, use service meshes, like, you know, with the uh, Istio or Envoy proxy and in Linkerd yeah. in that, they have a separate uh, engine yeah. or whatever that's maybe rewrites IP tables or something so that yeah. it intercepts everything going through in or out and it can do yeah. the, you know, fallback policy or, or you know, yeah, exactly. looking up different services, you know, instead forward to this other service instead if the one's failing. But yeah, I never yeah. really thought about it at the, uh, you know, with eBPF to do it at that same level. Same thing. Yeah, same yeah. thing. You, you know, you can do it uh, as a kernel module, deploy it, and it will do it for any application running on that Linux system, if you will, <laughs> um, or for all the applications deployed. Like if, if you make your eBPF program run, for example, in something like a Kubernetes cluster, and you can make it work for any application running on that cluster. So it just listens in the back and ensures that everybody is a good citizen, right? So, um, or monitor security for every container in that system. Um, All right, well, let's talk about Bela in, in particular. What is it exactly? Okay, yeah, so, um, our goal when we built Bela was to build a tool that could um, capture signals 
that are related to application observability. So not the infrastructure monitoring, but application monitoring. And in this specific case, application monitoring for web services. So mainly HTTP, HTTPS, obviously, and uh, gRPC to some extent. Um, that was the initial goal we set. And we were going to, in the beginning, only we started with Go. Because Go, from the auto instrumentation part, it's difficult to do. Right, it's there's been a couple of approaches. Uh, there's no easy way, like in Java, add an agent to application. And all of a sudden, it's auto instrument. It, it's that, that sort of thing doesn't exist for Go application. So we started with Go. Um, so capture primarily um, signals about HTTP, um, web services, and gRPC. For Go, we actually didn't tap into the kernel, but we use the BPF. There's an there's a different uh, method in eBPFs called uprobes, where you can do the same thing I described as for the kernel, but attach to any binary in Linux. So as long as it's a Linux binary, you can attach. Um, so we, we built this tooling that can attach to various parts of the Go application, assuming, because Go is really well behaved in terms of most web frameworks that are built in Go use the standard Go uh, SDK, so we know specific functions in Go that we can add ourselves to as a program. So when HTTP serve request happens, you're serving on HTTP request, we can attach to it and extract information such as what was the method, what was the URL, um, how many bytes did they send, how many bytes are we responding with, those kind of things, right? So, and you can take this information and figure out how long the request took and report it as a regular HTTP metric that people care about. So we find error code if it responded with an error because maybe the server has a problem or maybe it was like forbidden or whatever, like the normal HTTP response codes. And out of that, we generate events for metrics. So then you could um, show these metrics or track them over time and uh, build the world rules. Maybe your service is now all of a sudden has too many 500 errors and you're failing on something, then you can see this in visualization tools like Grafana, you know, do on call uh, support for it, and so on. That was the that was the initial uh, step. And so for this auto instrumentation part, we decided to use eBPF. Um, so the there's no uh, go develop of two chain changes, so you can build your application whichever way you like. Uh, as long as you're within the Go ecosystem, uh, you can strip symbols if you like. Uh, we'll still be able to find it. Uh, you can build your Go binary statically, so um, so it actually it's one single Linux binary. Um, you can do whatever you like. You don't have to worry about any sort of additional things you need to add to your Go application. Uh, which currently most people instrument Go applications manually, right? So they add right. trace points in their code, and um, yeah, which is not pretty. It requires <laughs> a lot of toil. Yeah, it's a it's a toil, and then yeah. um, and there's, there's other things such as like copy paste is a problem, right? So you copy paste the instrumentation, all of a sudden it's for something else, and you're reporting the wrong signals, or maybe you don't add it in this particular. Uh, HTTP handler, and all of a sudden, it's it's a problem, right? Um, so that was the first step. And then we said, well, since we have this now, um, how do we try to capture kernel events as well and see what happens with the other languages? So we started building out, once we tapped into the kernel and we started collecting signals about HTTP requests, uh, we started playing with different languages and frameworks. We tried Python, Node.js, Ruby, built Rust services, and slowly over time, we built up support enough to be able to serve and capture events from all these languages. So now we say we support any language. And we've had people uh, build services and use Bela to capture, I don't know, like I think somebody did R. I didn't even know that it's possible to write web services in R, but somebody reported that they, they tried an R service, which I thought it was like for data science. People use that. Yeah. Language. But some uh, apparently there's a web services framework written in R, and somebody tried it, and Bela was able to capture signals from that application. So 
even for languages like like Elixir or things like that, which is the support is very limited where you can get with open telemetry, you get open telemetry signals through Bela because we support at the protocol level, we can capture all these signals. Um, Could yeah. you so, show us how to, sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah, and then we added support for open SSL. That was another thing. So we wanted to be able to track HTTPS services, which was done by Go because at Go level, we tap uh, into the Go binary. So it's already done the decryption and stuff. So that was uh, a little bit more challenging. So we support open SSL 3 now by tapping into libssl because just like in any other Linux binary, we can inject these programs into libssl and tie it with the kernel events. So we have HTTPS support. Um, hmm. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying? Uh, cool. Yeah, I was just going to ask if you could show us how to get started with with Vela. How do you actually yeah. set it up and use it? Yeah, OK. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, maybe I'll try to do a little demo. I'll boot a simple awesome. um, Kubernetes demo. cluster. Demo. Yeah, like any demo, we may fail, but I'll try my best. <laughs> uh, so let me see if I can. That's all you uh, can do. <laughs> yes, exactly. Hope so I'm going to share enough offerings to the demo gods. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm show you, I have a little Kubernetes application here. This is based on our demo. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to show you what this means and how we actually stole this from our uh, demo, which is in our repo. It's open source repo, right? So, so what I have here is, some configuration is a Kubernetes cluster, but um, so I'm going to pull this internet from not even Grafana application. This is the other developer that works with me on this project, Mario uh, Macias. Uh, so he's got this uh, published some gold blog service that is uninstrumented. So this is something random of the internet, if you will, um, an image that we're pulling. Here and then I'm going to show you. So this is not instrumented. There's no instrumentation in it. So we're going to, in the same um, Kubernetes cluster, attach something else, which is this Grafana Bela auto instrumentation. So it's all you got to do. So you got to add a another, in this case, a sidecar container. Um, we need some privileges because we're going to be touching things inside that are privileged. And we finally have to say, well, this container of Bela, which is going to instrument something, we have to tell it to instrument this um, at port 8443, which is what this service opens up. So this Go blog application, which is a Go application, opens up port 0443. And we tell Bela, OK, well, you sh there's some open telemetry related stuff, but we say when you launch, look for any service in the system that is has opened this port. And once you see it, instrument it, please. That's all we do. So the rest of the stuff is just for debugging. And finally, in this system here, I have Grafana agent I'm going to deploy as well, which is configured to send data to uh, Grafana Cloud. In this case, I'm using Mimer for my um, metrics, and I'm going to use Tempo for my traces. Um, so this Grafana agent here has a configuration. This is very typical of how the agent is deployed. So in our application here, I'm just telling uh, Bela to send the events to my local agent, and the agent will take care of augmenting those data with anything else on this that it needs, and uh, eventually send it to um, uh, Grafana Cloud. Now, we're open source, so open telemetry, so you don't have to use the Grafana agent if you don't like, if you use the open telemetry collector. What your choices are for this third-party sources don't have to be Grafana products. If you don't, we hope you will use our products. But if you want to push to Prometheus or uh, to Jaeger or anything else that can support traces, you're free to do so. But this is just a, a demo. Um, and eventually, after I've booted everything up into my cluster, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some. Uh, I, it's this a blog post application, like a little tool written in Go that can 
you can suppose you can put various posts. So we're going to simulate somebody opening up various pages of this blog. And you can see the things um, I've set up here to, to hit. Sounds good? Sounds good. Let's, all right, let's see if we can do this. So uh, I've opened three windows because you're going to need a little bit of uh, stuff here. So <laughs> um, I'm going to do a kind. This is a. So I'm going to create a little Kubernetes cluster here. Um, so wait until that starts up. Um, yeah, I am going to make the the comment though on the uh, so so Mario did he create that load script? It yeah. really needs to be Grafana K six um, dog food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, true, true, true. Yeah, um, maybe we can help you with that. <laughs> maybe yes, yes. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, so that started. All right. So what I have here. So um, into my in this folder is the same thing that I was showing you there. What I can show you is my credentials because I uh, <laughs> to run this demo, uh, I should be really careful about not to touch the file. Uh, so we have a credentials template in our demo. So I'm going to show you that. Um, so we can do something like this. And you can see, well, essentially, I've, I've created a, a free account in Grafana um, where I, I'm able to get is endpoints uh, for my tempo. What is my tempo user? I've created a Grafana API key. Um, so we give you a template where you can just do this yourself, like open a free Grafana account, um, get this information, and you're set to go. Once you plug it in, that's all you really need to get this demo working. So in here, I'm just going to do kubectl um, fly-f. And so it starts with zero one. This is my credentials now. So I'm not using the template. I'm using the ones that I've actually um, added. And so then I'm going to deploy this agent. So so we got a Grafana agent. So let's see what's happening here. So I'm going to start K9s over here. Hopefully with the screen. Yeah, so it's starting. So I have a typical Kubernetes system here. Uh, and now so far I have my Grafana agent running. We can see its log. Nothing special about this. Um, that's as good as it gets. So maybe I can extend the screen like this a little bit so we can see more things. Um, OK, so now that I've started the Grafana agent, I'm going to launch. I'm going to add the application, so this instrumented app. So like we said this instrumented app application has two containers. One is this gold block service written by Mario, and the other one is Bela, which is going to instrument the service. So we can see what's going on here in this Kubernetes system. So uh, we've got a gold block. Um, so Bela is running. Um, it's printing various messages, and we have the Go blog. All right, <clears throat> everything's up and running. So so far the demo is working. Um, so I port forward. So I'm going to forward this port <clears throat> here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to expose this port now to my internal port eight four four three for this service, the Go blog, um, to my machine. So let's try that. OK, seems to be doing something. <laughs> and let's I'm going to open the some blogs. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. I'm going to open this. So Bela is printing various messages it's in debug mode. So it's looking for various executables that launch on my system here. It's not important. So we're here uh, in the same folder, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to run that load gen. That should be K6. And. <laughs> And it's running all this stuff in the background. We don't want to watch that. So I'm just going to close that off. But maybe zoom this. And now you can see that Bela is tracking various calls that this little program is making in the back, right? Um, so we're printing on the screen here. Uh, we can see the Go Block service getting all these things uh, as, a, 
as a load. Um, and at the same time, Bailey's tracking everything that's happening, right? We track the time it took for each of those requests. Um, and so it's kind of interesting I want to point out. So we, we have two times over here, right? So one is this millisecond thing. The other one is this microsecond. I'll get back to that. I'll explain a little bit about that as well. Uh, but for now, let's just say we're tracking all these requests. <clears throat> So now, hopefully, I can open my screen here. I want to switch to Grafana to show you how this works. I'm hoping I'm not going to cause infinite uh, <laughs> zoom here. But so this is my Grafana Cloud account uh, where I have my traces here. So here's my tempo. So I open and explore. So if I run query, maybe not the last six hours, my query search. Let's see, run, and here we go. So in here, I see all these events appearing. So you notice how like we, so we have a specific trace and this trace, I, I, we have all the events collected. We have various attributes picked up by Bela. We know that what was the server port, what was the full URL path, and then we know that we get it was a get request. So now it's interesting. You, you see this thing that we, we did here. So for HTTP route, we don't have the full URL path, um, but we have this static with a star. So Bela recognizes, it has a mode where we automatically recognize paths and reduce the cardinality so that when these metrics get generated in something like Prometheus, you don't pay a lot. So we try to reduce the cardinality so you don't get a cardinality explosion and make your queries slow and expensive. Hmm. Um, so if you see over here, I talked about this uh, timing thing um, where we had this two times. So Bale is able, because it's doing this at the level of the, at the kernel, if you will, and tracking the go runtime, we're able to tell when the request actually started for real. So it's expect, accepting data and it's booting up inside the Go runtime. And we're also able to distinguish that from the time it took to process the request. Um, and why these times are different. So whenever you have a Go application, uh, it internally has these Go routines which run every request, if you will, if every HTTP request. Now, these Go routines need a kernel or application thread, if you will, um, to run that on. So it takes a bit of time for this request to set up. If you are instrumenting just the time your application took inside the Go handler, you will see only this time, the processing time. You don't see this time it took in queue for this request to be served by your application. So with Bela, we can get really much richer information, something closer to what the client is experiencing not just the time it took for your handler to run, but how much it took for the Go runtime to wake up and actually be able to serve this request. So just like I'm having my um, uh, a view of my traces here, I can switch to Prometheus over here. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah. And I can just, uh, I guess I have to select the metric. Um, so we, we capture many, metrics for example we capture duration seconds and um, we can see what that looks like and we see the various routes and as the application is running we know that this particular one which is i guess entry is the slowest one um, so all this automatically happened without any intervention on the developer side right there's no particular thing. And we reduce the routes to something that is low cardinality. So we really have only five routes where the application was doing a lot more. Like if we see that script that Mario has, it has all these things, right? So we collapse everything that has entry that potentially could cause cardinality explosion under something that's automatically detected as not a, a low cardinality route. Um, and finally, this, what we produce here is fully compatible with our application observability. So 
if we go into Grafana application observability, uh, we should be able to, after I refresh the page, see our global bot service here. Oh, not yet. Last five minutes. Oh, actually remove this. Let's see. Refresh. And there we go. So, so we have GoBlog application here, and this is our application of the plugin tracking all the requests um, for any particular rep that we have. And so <clears throat> since we capture a little bit of information here, this may not actually be the full um, output that you would see from manual instrumentation, but it does have enough information to go on. I, I think uh, we'll be able to see some traces, so most of these things will just work for the stuff. What doesn't work is the service map, and I'll get to that in a second. You won't be able to see, we'll see some data here um, because we don't have that yet, but it's coming soon. Yeah, so that was it, right? Do you guys, what do you guys think about the demo? That's, That's awesome. Cool. Yeah, so any, have, any I way I can questions. be lazy. Yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like um, Bela can forward metrics and traces, right? Yeah. But you can choose so, one or the other if you'd love it. Like you can also say, I don't care about traces. So I'm just right. Care. Yeah. Or I can just say, I don't have any, I don't like metrics. I don't believe in that. I'm just going to use traces. Some people like to do that. Um, yeah. So, so we recently, by recently, I mean like in the last month or two, we had on Joe Elliott, who came to talk to us on office hours about tempo. Mm -hmm. And we briefly touched on eBPF. And he said he didn't think it was possible to do distributed tracing using eBPF. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> Lies. Lies. <laughs> um, so in our main branch, we currently do have distributed traces working. We haven't released that yet for Go. Ah. Um, and so how do we do that? Um, so the approach we're going to we take for Go will be very different than the approach we're going to take for any other language. Um, and I'm not going to talk about any other language yet, because I don't know exactly if it's going to work. So I'm just going to keep my mouth shut about that. Um, <laughs> But uh, for for Go, uh, what we do is we um, generate the trace IDs uh, at eBPF time now. So, so if you will, a request comes into the first application. Uh, assuming it's Go application, it's all instrumented with Bela. Uh, we we get the first request. There's no trace parent. There's no trace ID. We generate one. And then we track inside. So how do, how do, so we track the incoming request, maybe going, maybe doing an outgoing request. So this tracking uh, works because we can plug into the Go runtime as well. So whenever a particular Go application, uh, Go routine handles an incoming request, we get information about the parent-child relationship between Go routines and Go. And so if it's going an outgoing request, we track that, well, this Go routine now created an outgoing request. And here's another Go routine perhaps there if they didn't do a synchronous call. And that other Go routine had a pair in the original one. So we're able to track it through the Go runtime as these Go routines get and, and actually uh, start the flow within the Go application. So with that, we're able to tie that this incoming request made this outgoing request. So that's the first step. Um, because we have tracking inside the Go runtime. We attach these probes into new proc one, it's called, um, in the Go runtime. So as we know that this incoming server request for which we have generated a trace ID does this outgoing server request. Now at the time this outgoing server request is going to write its HTTP headers. We get access to the Go uh, if memory in this HTTP header. And this, we write, the trace ID just as you would with a manual instrumentation. Mm -hmm. So with eBPF, we modify the Go managed memory with the trace ID that we know. At a specific time, 
and a specific place in the Go libraries where we know it's safe to do so. We don't grab external memory. This memory is already pre-allocated by the Go program itself because it needs a buffer to send the outgoing request. We know at which time exactly we're going to do this. We're able to write down what you would normally do with um, manual instrumentation, if you will. So you can manually add this header information, but we do it for you, just like you would in by yourself. Um, this doesn't work in some scenarios. Uh, and as one particular scenario doesn't work uh, for, which is um, secure boot on Linux. So if you have an environment, which is rare in virtual machines and Kubernetes, but there's out, ones out there which use secure boot. Um, and in that scenario, we're not allowed to write memory. But it's a restriction that's sort of obscure. If people running it on, like myself, I can't do it. Uh, on my local laptop. Uh, so I have to boot a virtual machine to actually develop this functionality myself because my Linux machine has secure boot on and I can't actually write memory with eBPF. It's one of those APIs that are locked down. Um, so that's, that's what we do for Go. So we are in the process of making the same thing happen for gRPC. Uh, we currently have something in our source that does gRPC, but it's not ideal because it doesn't catch all scenarios. So um, we're working right now to make that happen. And once we're done with that, we're going to try to do the same thing or something similar for other languages. Now, um, some languages will be simpler, I would say. Um, but the main challenge is not every language or framework has the same way of managing the internal threads. So for languages such as maybe Python or Ruby or Node.js, which are primarily um, single threaded in nature, if you will, um, that would be easier. For languages like Java, it's almost impossible. Like if somebody is using something like a reactive framework where they do all this, <laughs> yeah, it's like <laughs> impossible to handle, to <laughs> track the request within the Runtime? No, it's not yeah. doable. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what uh, uh, this is what uh, the Tempo folks had in mind. That it's extremely hard to do, but goes small steps at a time. Uh, maybe certain frameworks. This may be what Joe thought it would never be able to do because simply tracking those thread requests within the application is impossible. But fortunately for us, for some languages and runtimes, this is actually not that difficult. Um, but for others like .NET and Java. I have another question. Mm -hmm. You showed us how to visualize the trace information on Grafana Cloud, but you can also, you, you don't have to use application observability app, right? Like you, if yeah. you don't have Grafana Cloud, you can still use Bela. For sure, yeah. So you can build your own dashboards for that purpose. For me, it was just, you know, I didn't have to, build dashboards here. So I could just show application observability and have those nice metrics show up there. Uh, but you have the underlying data. That was the first thing I was showing with Explore. Um, and uh, you could take the sources either like from memory or Prometheus or anything you have else you have where it can support metrics and open telemetry, you can build your own dashboards. And we have community members that have done that. Um, Grafana Vela, we have a default dashboard that we put in our repo if you want to upload it and you can just attach it, uh, add it to your Grafana instance and use it um, as well. So I'd also like to, if we can, touch briefly on some other alternatives for Bela, like mm -hmm. the one that comes to mind for for instance, is that Grafana Labs has a partnership with Isovalent Isovalent. Yeah. And so how and they create Cilium. How does Cilium compare to Bela? What, what's the relationship there? Do, do they do the same thing? What's the difference? Yeah, I think it's very similar to, to what happens in terms of Cilium has this network overlay. So they capture everything at sort of the network level, similar to what we do for programming languages other than Go to some extent. Um, there's some limitations to that. And I don't want to say some approaches are better than others, but um, we believe that instrumenting at the application level or getting deeper, closer to the application rather than a network level can give us richer information 
Um, for example, with Go, uh, we're able to extract information about the runtime. Um, and for example, in the future, we can produce event information such as how much time the Go application takes time in garbage collection. So these metrics are important for Go developers or um, for Java developers, folks like that, which is sort of unrelated to network events. Those events are specific to the application itself. Um, we can track HTTPS calls or protocols, add protocols for SQL or other languages much easier because it's at uh, the level of the application as well. Um, so for example, for Go, we do track SQL calls. So you can have information about what, what is the SQL request um, sanitized. We, we don't let the, the full SQL request appear because that could have private information as well. Um, and yeah, HTTPS, we track with libssl. I know that there's some attempts that Cilium, I think there may have been talk. I don't know, don't quote me on this. Uh, that they were could use H they could do HTTPS now with some exporting of certificates uh, so their requests are decrypted at the time and their network events. Um, we tap directly into libssl, so none of that setup needs to be done. So the application is serving with certificates that are in the application deployed. There's no need to do any sort of management like that. We intercept those calls uh, at libssl. Um, so I think in the future, more information can be extracted um, with eBPF by getting closer to the applications themselves. Um, that would, as an application developer in the past, working on SaaS application, cared about these events. Um, mm -hmm. For example, how many Go routines do I have in flight in a Go application, or how much do I time do I spend in garbage collection in a Java application? Those are really important events. Um, yeah. And, uh, but we do use Cilium. I mean, at least part of the library ourselves. So like, we love Cilium. Um, we, Bela is built with Cilium Go, uh, eBPF, uh, which is invaluable for the work we do. So um, yeah, at some level, this same information can be extracted, I would say, with Cilium's tooling as well. We think we can add value add um, with some of these additional metrics. That's cool. Yeah. And that's interesting too, that, you know, that we're, you Bela is utilizing the Cilium binaries to, uh, use, to read, I guess the eBPF, yeah. uh, technology ads. So it's like, yeah. so it's like Bela, Cilium, eBPF. Yeah. Some extent. Yeah. Some extent. Yeah. yeah. So many layers. Yeah. It's like an onion. Yeah. It, it is um, hard to think of these things in many different <laughs> levels. And there are on each level, there's an approach. And on a higher level are the service meshes. So we talked about that a little bit before. How is Bela different from a service mesh like Istio or Linkerd? Yeah. And they, I think they, you can, I find them very similar to Cilium in the same, in the same way. It's, they can extract some information. Uh, about level layer seven TCP events like HTTP, but anything anything like how do you do HTTP two, right? Where mm. there's just streams of data flying through, um, and how do you do gRPC and things like that? So um, implementing monitoring at that level for some of these protocols is going to be challenging, and extracting more richer events for application observability, it's gonna be a problem. And um, if I can share my screen for a second more. So sure. I'm gonna show you what our goal is. So I don't know if you can share my screen. So I go with Bela is to uh, do exactly this. This is, um, I'm showing you open telemetry demo, uh, which we have actually here in Grafana. Um, and but this open telemetry demo is fully instrumented right. uh, with manual instrumentation. There's been a lot of work put in here to actually get this data coming in. Uh, so we have a service map because we, this demo internally passes all those um, trace pairs between the applications. So we know that who's calling who. Uh, we have all these different languages. Um, and for if we open, say, like, example, this ad service here, we can see the JVM metrics. 
this is where we're getting to with Vela. This is our vision, that we will be able to do the exact same thing with auto instrumentation. That's our ultimate goal, that you'll be able oh, to wow. get That'll be all this data, impressive. all this data, the service map, everything, how, what calls what, as well as these metrics without having to do anything on the applications themselves, but adding Vela into the system. And I think some of these richer events require uh, more than just what you can do at service meshes or network overlays, because it's not just about the network events. It's about context propagation between applications. It's about capturing some of these runtime information um, and you know, capturing error information, maybe stack traces about errors. You know, I have errors and then getting information about what happened during that error. Um, we'll be able to actually push the envelope on that in the future with the approach we've taken. That's my belief, and that's what we're aiming for. Those are some lofty ambitions. Mm. I'm surprised yeah. you're publicly <laughs> committed to yeah. it. <laughs> I'm not I mean, in the idea. States I mean, that's what I want to get. <laughs> yeah. And just to say, it's it's going to be in this year, right? Um, <laughs> yes. I think yes, he said this month. Are, oh, yeah, wait. This I month, meant, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah wait, yeah. it is 2024 now. So, yeah, this <laughs> month. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for, for coming on. We are out of time, but this was this was really great to see exactly how to set up Bela. And it seemed like it was pretty easy to, to set up, especially just within Kubernetes. Right. Yeah, yeah. If people want to know more about Bela, where would you suggest that they go? Well, we have uh, a repo has a lot of information. Um, there's a lot of e examples in. I don't know. Do, do you need the link? Uh, yeah, oh, it's right there uh, down it's below. It's also linked okay. in the description on YouTube. That's great. Um, yeah, so we, we have <laughs> Nicole uh, runs a tight ship. <laughs> yeah and so um so in here we have a lot of examples in terms of kubernetes deployments without kubernetes various modes you can run bela and tracking short-lived processes with system-wide instrumentation it's all in our tests um so and we found a lot of folks just dig through this code and find the obscure things we haven't documented but we have for the stuff we do support we have extensive documentation so that's another place to look for. Um, yes, exactly. So this information here. Um, so the documentation has a tutorial, um, extensive information about all the configuration options for fine tuning and, and so on. So that's the second place to look for. Um, we've published with blog posts. So it's a microphone account uh, blog. Yeah, I don't have a link for that, but um but it contains mostly the information um that we actually have in our documentation uh, yeah. okay great thank you so much for coming on and if anybody has any questions on bela you can probably the best place is to go to either raise an issue on the github repo or you can go to the community support forum I think that's yeah. probably the the be the two best places to go. Thank yeah. you everybody for for coming and watching. And Nicola, thank you for telling us for for appeasing the demo gods enough to get two <laughs> demos out <laughs> and for showing yes. and for answering all of our questions. Yes, cool. And reminding me that I have a lot of stuff to look into still. <laughs> <laughs> so, really do cool. so do I. So do I. We all do. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next Bye time. Bye, all. Bye.